reason I picked this particular topic is because anytime we have a new technology, um, a lot of folks, investors in particular, get very, very overexcited about the possibilities. We start, start attributing all sorts of uh, magical properties to this technology, and this is a bit of a reality check. So the, the basic, the controversial title is why tokens are not magic. What that actually means is how you can actually think about liquidity on Web3 networks and when tokens help and when they don't. All right, so before we start talking about Web3 and, and tokens, let's briefly touch on uh, the cold start problem. That uh, term has become pretty famous these days thanks to a book that came out by its name. I'm sure many of you have read it. I have a lot of disagreements with that book but we agree on the core idea, which is what a cold start problem is and how you solve it. The basic idea is this. If you're a network, on day zero, you have no users. Without users, you have no product value. Without product value, you can't get new users. So you have to hack your way to a minimum viable network, what Andrew Chen calls an atomic network, to kickstart your network effects. That's called liquidity. When you have enough users where the network has some value, you see interactions going back and forth. And this affects all types of networks, marketplaces, social networks, Web 2, Web 3, that doesn't really matter. Oops, wrong side. There we go. Now, here's another way to visualize the cold start problem. This is from Chris Dixon at Andreessen Horowitz. Basically says that when you have no users, you have no network utility. As you find a way to attract them, your network utility goes up and you've solved the cold start problem. Now, tokens are assumed to be some sort of a solution to this problem. The idea is this, you give away your token as a financial incentive to users when you don't have any network utility or product value. So you essentially, in a way, pay them to join, but the token has really high financial upside. Uh, as the token brings in users, your network utility, which is the blue line, goes up. And as your project matures, the financial upside of the token, which is the green line, normalizes. So that seems logical, right? Uh, in the early days, you give away the token as a financial incentive, users join, boom, cold start, cold start problem gone. Uh, so let's take a, couple of, uh, take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, there's a few projects where this seems to have worked fairly well. One is a project called Helium. And I'll touch on Helium later in this presentation as well. There's a, a lot of layers to unpack there. Helium is a decentralized network that allows you to provide internet access to IoT sensors and devices in the wild. So if you wanted to join Helium's network, you would go and buy their hotspot, connect it to your router. That hotspot then provides internet access to those IoT devices out in the wild, and you earn h &T tokens as you continue to do that. There is ARVEVE, which is a decentralized storage network, uh, somewhat similar to projects like Filecoin and Storage. If you wanted to join ARVs network, you would basically just hook up some spare hard drive space to ARV, and ARVs users can then store data on it. And as long as you continue to host that data, you earn AR tokens. And then we have Compound, which is a decentralized lending network. If you wanted to join Compound's network, you would go and deposit your crypto assets into their liquidity pool. And as long uh, and when you do that, borrowers get to access it in exchange for interest, and you earn comp tokens uh, for providing liquidity to, the, to that network. Now, in each of these cases, Helium, ARV, Compound, the token was a pretty effective hack uh, to bootstrap in the early days and to get the network rolling. But these networks have something in common. They all require passive participation from the supply side of the network, which means once you connect your hotspot, or you uh, connect your hard drive, or you deposit your crypto assets, there's nothing else you need to do. You will continue to earn tokens afterwards. But these types of networks are pretty rare. The, most of the networks we use in our day-to-day -day lives are active networks. You have to go and actively use them to get value from them. So let's say you signed up as an Airbnb host. Uh, if you never go in and accept bookings, you add no value to the network. You signed up for TikTok. You don't go in and post anything. You don't see. You don't watch anything. You add no value to the network. So our tokens are a viable way to bootstrap networks like that. That's the billion-dollar question. So before we get to that, let me revisit this uh, evolution of network utility for passive networks. Again, you give away your token as a financial incentive. That brings users in. Network utility goes up. Now, unfortunately, networks with active participation are a little more complicated than this. Uh, because they don't just need adoption. 
they require recurring engagement from users. And because of that, most of these active networks, they tend to start out by targeting the most underserved users. And by that, I mean users that feel the pain that your network solves so deeply that they will jump through multiple hoops to engage with your product, even when it is clunky and broken, as most early stage networks are. When you get a critical mass of those underserved users, they are very, very motivated to use your network on a recurring basis. And that engagement pushes you out of the cold start problem. Unfortunately, tokens are a pretty terrible way to attract users like that. Because a financial incentive appeals to everyone, not just to the most underserved users. It's a pretty untargeted measure. It's a very blunt tool. And so odds are, when you start using your token to attract users, you will attract an awful lot of users who don't care as much about the core value proposition of your network. And it becomes very, very difficult to build a critical mass of those underserved users. And when that happens, your network utility looks like this. Oops. There we go. You see really strong growth out of the gates as the token brings in new users. But most of these users are in for the token. Very few actually care about the network. You never get the critical mass. Network utility never actually takes off. And you see this long and painful decline. But this seems like an extreme theoretical example. Right? I just drew this on a, on a chart. Obviously, you can't see this in the real world. So let's look at, take a look at a few examples. Oops. The first one is called LooksRare, which is a decentralized NFT marketplace which launched in January of this year. They launched with what is known as a vampire attack against OpenSea, which is a common terminology used in the Web3 world. What that means is that they distributed their own Lux token or airdropped them to all high volume OpenSea users and also rewarded users with their token whenever certain NFT collections were traded uh, on LuxRail. So you would assume that that would be enough for them to bootstrap and scale the network. But this is what trading volume in the first couple of months actually looked like on their network. Looks remarkably similar to what we saw in the last slide. Now keep in mind, uh, this chart ends at, the, uh, at early March 2022, which is well before uh, the significant collapse that we saw in the NFT market, uh, which happened later in the year. Uh, but at this time, NFT trading volumes were still relatively healthy. And also, this chart filters out something known as wash trading, which is when you have the same NFT being traded back and forth between the same two wallets to earn more tokens, because, of course, there's a way to do that. And so thankfully, there are helpful users in Dune Analytics who have filtered that out for us. So if you look at what's happening on this chart, by the end of February 2022, trading volumes on LuxRare had dropped to less than 5% of their peak in early January and had dropped to less than 3% of the trading volume of Lux tokens. So I'll, I'll repeat that. People were trading the Lux token 30 times more than they were trading NFTs on their marketplace. That, that tells you all you need to know. People were there to speculate and earn tokens. They were not there to engage with the core value proposition. And there are other vampire attacks that have led to very, very similar results. There was another decentralized NFT marketplace called Infinity, which, lo which launched in October 2021. And they had a similar vampire attack against OpenSea. It was two months before this one. That one lasted for one month. And then there was a decentralized exchange called SushiSwap, which executed a vampire attack against Uniswap in August of 2020. Now, that one being, a, being an exchange, you would assume that speculation would, would, would work. But same pattern, except over two years instead of two months. So that, that same pattern, you see it over and over again anytime you start uh, using tokens as a bootstrapping mechanism for these actively used networks. Somewhat less obvious examples are the virtual worlds that everyone seems to love these days. Uh, I mean, we, we use the term Web3 metaverses to describe them. I hate that term, uh, at least used in this context, but I guess it'll have to do. Uh, by this, I mean projects like Decentraland, uh, Sandbox, and uh, other side. Now, these projects and these virtual worlds uh, started selling virtual land or virtual real estate to their users. The goal of that exercise was that users, the idea was users would buy this virtual land and they would develop it, do something with it in the virtual world, and that would drive engagement and bring in users. So again, theoretically, that seems to make sense. But if you look at what's happened in Decentraland, something else seems to be happening. So this 
plots the number of landowners on Decentraland against the number of daily active users. There are now well over 5,000 landowners, and there was an awful lot of interest in 2021 in particular when you see that acceleration. But they've never had more than a couple of hundred daily active users. And you can see the zero correlation between those two lines. Because the vast majority of virtual land buyers are financial buyers. They were acquiring this in the hope that it would go up in value, and they weren't actually doing anything with it. So obviously, if you're not doing anything with it, it's not going to have any impact on engagement. Now, I don't mean to say that virtual land can never have any value. This is tech, anything is possible. But the path to virtual land and virtual real estate being valuable is going to look an awful lot more like an active Web2 network like Roblox compared to a passive Web3 network like Helium. Now, if you're a passive Web3 network, obviously you can then use tokens to bootstrap your network. But that doesn't mean that it's a get out of jail free card. It's still a network. It still needs to be scaled the right way, whether it's Web2, Web3, Web5, Web Infinity, doesn't actually matter. And the best case study of how not to scale a network is Helium. So again, to remind you, Helium is a decentralized network that provides internet access to the external IoT uh, sensors and devices, devices that, do, that you don't own but uh, exist elsewhere, like a scooter on the street, for example. Helium used the h and token as an incentive to attract uh, hotspot buyers. And as that h and token appreciated in price, an awful lot of people bought those hotspots. The last number I saw was close to a million uh, that were installed. Unfortunately, they barely had any demand to generate revenue for all these hotspot owners. The last number I saw was that they have a monthly GMV of $1,150 across 1 million hotspots. Finding out about this after you've scaled your network is a pretty terrible idea. Because now you have hundreds of thousands of hotspot owners who think that they got conned, and you've raised money at a billion dollar valuation, and you're trying to pivot to create something remotely useful so that uh, you can live up to that valuation. And these are all avoidable problems. So if you were Helium, how would you have scaled this the right way? This is an idea that I call laddering. So again, you would start the same way. Use your token to attract your earliest base of hotspot buyers. But crucially, you cap the number of hotspot buyers to the minimum number you need to create a functional and viable network in a very small region on the supply side. And leveraging that, you attract your initial base of demand. And then you only scale supply in response to increasing demand. When I say this to, to Web3 founders, sometimes I get a question, well, what if Demand doesn't increase. Well, then that's the market telling you that your network doesn't work. It's not useful. Tokens don't fix a value proposition that's broken. And frankly, we should be seeing an awful lot more pivots in the Web3 world, because that's what you do when something doesn't work. But people are so busy flipping tokens, they forget about that. The second question I get is, well, if you limit supply-side adoption, aren't you limiting the price of the token? The answer is yes, you are. And you need to let your user community know and set expectations that you will be scaling this network sustainably, which means only scaling demand in response to supply. You wouldn't make product or GTM decisions based on what your stock price looks like tomorrow or next week. So why would you base it on uh, what your token price is likely to look like tomorrow or next week? So to recap, if you just need passive participation from users, you can use tokens as one tactic, not the only tactic, one tactic to overcome the cold start problem. Oops. But if you need active participation, token rewards can and will do more harm than good. And remember, tokens are not magic. They can help you in some very, very specific situations, but you still need to build and scale your network in the right way if you want to have any shot at success. And so quick reminder, this is a small part of my course called, Pl called Applied Network Effects. I'm actually uh, doing a cohort right now. The next one should be in January. If you guys are interested, just Google for Applied Network Effects, and you'll find out everything you need to know. And that's it. Uh, I deliberately kept this presentation short. I know it's a very controversial topic, and luckily, I don't shy away from controversy. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I left enough time for, for questions. Are there any questions, comments, disagreements, concerns? There you go. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I have a question about active participation and using tokens to support kind of active participation like Swiss coins. Mm -hmm. Is there a problem with the 
Good question. I mean, I wouldn't call Sweatcoin active participation because fundamentally the way it works is you you load it up, you link up your, your stats to it or your Google Fit to it, and as you walk, you continue to earn coins, right? So fundamentally, it doesn't require active participation. It's all you're doing with those tokens later is you're, you're trying to spend them. Now, there's certain strange behaviors that incentivizes, like you know people not, aren't necessarily walking in there. For example, they stuck a Fitbit on their dog. Uh, and so th these are the, the things you tend to incentivize when uh, when you essentially just bake token rewards as the core value proposition of your of your network, there's got to be something else beyond that. The token needs to be can be an add-on, it can be a a benefit. But for example, even Helium is well, I'd say one step better than that, where there is a core core value proposition of the network. Maybe it doesn't work, but you're meant to provide internet access to someone, and you earn based on that. Uh, so that's the core value proposition. Right? It's not just uh, that there is a user there who benefits from uh, other users being on, and it's not just earn tokens by installing an app on your phone. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, of non-DeFi marketplaces, we're all around digitizing a really offline experience, and and a lot of the supply side, in particular, as we've just heard, is not especially tech savvy. Right? But, but now these, these tokens kind of assume a pretty high level of sophistication already, which would imply that there's already a way to access whatever's being provided. Mm -hmm. and, and so my question is, is kind of if you take a step back, how do, you, how do you then incentivize and bring people along with this idea of tokens if they're not already in this world? Because otherwise the market's just not big enough, I think, to build a meaningful marketplace. It's a great question. I mean. A part of this is just answered by, uh, have you heard of the book Crossing the Chasm? Uh, it, yeah, the, the, the technology is third cycle, right? So if you, if you look at what's happening in Web3 right now, a lot, a lot of Web3 builders are just building for other Web3 users, and frankly, there's not a whole lot of them. Um, because a lot, of people don't, a lot of people that are external to the Web3 ecosystem don't quite get what the value proposition is. And frankly, I think even Web3 founders are struggling with building out unique value propositions. The, the only ones that I've seen um, actual end user products, not protocols, that seem to somewhat work are when founders actually start to realize that, okay, what can we actually do with a token that is legal? And so I was advising a company in uh, a, a Sequoia-backed company, which essentially started using them as a tradable loyalty point. So essentially it was a stable coin. Uh, the only idea is you could cash out the stable coin anytime you wanted, so which was sort of a, a minor value add. But I think pretty much everybody is struggling with that. I mean, even Web3 founders are trying to figure out what the value proposition is. If you look at most successful Web3 companies today and you draw a value chain, usually somebody at the end of that value chain is speculating on a token. Uh, it's very really hard to find a company where that's not happening. Uh, Helium, I think, was one, one of the first attempts where we were, they were trying to create a separate value chain, but again, it went back into the same sort of world. So I think the first step is just discovering value propositions that are useful, even for early adopters, that are not necessarily speculative by nature. And only then can we think about bringing essentially normies into it. Uh, I think we're very, very far removed from that, to be honest. We're nowhere close to a, a real world value proposition for an average user. Any others? Yes. Thank you. So. I know you're also an investor with a breadcrumb VC, and as I understood, you always have the first check-in, or at least you invest in a very early stage when there's still that cold start problem. Mm -hmm. So how do you assess the companies that have that, that issue as a, from an investor's perspective? Good question. Uh, so from, from my point of view, I invest early, I go pre-seed, but I don't do pre-product. And the reason for that is when you, whenever you're evaluating a network, um, Every network is built around an interaction, an interaction between two sets of users. And if you want to create a new network effect and you're not, you don't want to for, run into somebody else's network effect, you need to build a unique interaction. In order for that unique, unique interaction to work, if you want to solve the cold start problem, you'd basically have to create a, a small functional network somewhere. So generally, I'm not evaluating the scale of it. I don't care about your user growth, because at seed, pre-seed, you can hack that in unhealthy ways. What I care about is how well the early interaction works. 
what's the retention, what's the engagement, even if you have 50 users, 500 users? What does that look like? So what I'm looking for is products or networks that have solved the cold start problem at very, very small scale, or the smallest scale possible, whenever I see them. Um, whenever I see networks that, that go, oh, we're just focusing on one side right now, and where you know, we have thousands of users on that side, we'll come back to the other side later. Usually that means that the other side is hard. It doesn't make me feel good when I try to acquire that side, so I'm going to focus on this side. <laughs> so generally those I try and avoid. And there's these other founders that go, we're investing in paid marketing, and so we're going to scale our user base, and at some point we'll see better retention. That never works. You always need to start with what is the smallest functional network you can build, and then build it out from there. So that's what I'm looking for. Have you created an, intera a small, an interaction with a small base of users? That works. The, the one thing you need to remember with a net no network is that the product you've built is simply a shell. The users are the real product. So essentially what you have to do is small network, layer a smaller net network on that, and then you keep building from that. So until you have that smaller base of users, you have no product. Thank you so much, Samir. Thank you.